Well, well, thank you very much indeed, Barry, for that. Um, it's always difficult to follow when someone has made such a wonderful, wonderful introduction to you. <laughs> you kind of feel it can only go down after that. Um, but it is, it, is a, it is a genuine pleasure to be here. I've been to Bruges groups. Uh, meetings before, and I, I always remember, of course, that it was in the year I got elected, 1989, 28 years ago, as a member of parliament, that the Bruges group was actually formed. So I feel I've kind of part of the uh, history of, of the Bruges group. And I, and I want to pay tribute not just to Barry, but to everybody within the Bruges group over the years who have kept faith with the basic principles that the EU is an undemocratic, anti-democratic organisation and that we needed to get out of it. And that keeping of faith uh, has kept through the days when I don't think anyone really thought there was a chance of a referendum. Way back when I first got elected, the idea that there would be a referendum on leaving or, or the, the European Union was just never envisaged. But all that time, you kept the faith. The days when we had a, a Labour government led by Tony Blair, who first told us all as Labour MPs and as the country we had to be good Europeans. Well, I think I'm a good European. I'm just not a good eu European. And I... I, I <laughs> but there was that time under Tony Blair when huge amounts of effort went into working with the EU. Uh, and that also was a time when you all kept the faith that we could change things. And during the Maastricht Treaty, which uh, I uh, opposed my party on, John Smith was the leader, I got the call later that night that uh, I was going to be sacked from my wonderfully important shadow front bench spokesperson as the number three in the Citizens' Charter unit. <laughs> so I... Under, under Mo Molum, actually. So I, I wouldn't want you to think that I um, made some huge sacrifice at the time uh, of, uh, when I was sacked for voting against Maastricht. But we went through the Lisbon Treaty, the EU Constitution, all of that. And during all of those things which were passed, those treaties that were passed without any consultation uh, with the British people, you kept the faith. And I think now, more than ever we are at a stage where we really do need to keep to the strict faith. Let us be under no illusion. There is a concerted, a very, very determined, a very, very well-funded group of people made up of various elements of the establishment who are fighting back to overthrow the will of the British people. These are, the, uh, these are the same people who woke up on June the 24th last year who just could not believe, just could not believe that, inverted commas, the ordinary people, or as Barry Shearman, one of my colleagues, would say, the uneducated people, uh, had not listened to them. They hadn't listened to the so-called experts, the EU-funded think tanks, the academics, the professors, the bankers, the former members of the European Parliament, many of them on fat pensions waiting for them to come through. And they were shocked. It was a profound shock, that result to them. It actually wasn't a shock to me because I had done those rallies all across the north of England uh, where I had seen the enthusiasm of people who'd come out, never been to a rally in their lives, never had got involved in politics before, never had voted many of them before, and they showed that they meant to vote. They came out in their millions. And I always felt that if we could get those people out on the day, we would win. But it was a shock to them. It took them time to recover. I think the first few months they were in such shock that they didn't get that fight back. But now they are fighting back and we're seeing it big time. I always think sometimes being a London MP that the Evening Standard's now got under its uh, new editor, who of course was the uh, person who most, most did the uh, Project Fear, 
Mr. George Osborne, that uh, the Evening Standard, we should actually change its name and just call it the Evening EU because it's actually a paper that now is doing as much as it can in every way possible to denigrate those who are trying to get a negotiation deal for us to leave the European Union. We've got Open Britain, hugely again well-funded and operating full-time propaganda for the EU. And it is the very same people involved in that who've now come back from their shock. And they're colluding with each other to really try to change things and to change the mood of the country. I could spend the next 10 minutes talking about the BBC, uh, <laughs> but uh, I won't. But I just, there was a very good tweet the other day. Isn't Twitter wonderful? You do actually read things that you never would read anywhere else. Uh, the BBC, home of despite Brexit. Have you heard that? Um, despite Brexit? Yes. Everything is happening. Everything that's good is despite Brexit. And you go through this list of... Um, Ryanair raises passenger growth forecast despite Brexit. Retail sales rose in July despite Brexit slump fears. Food and drink sector confident despite Brexit. A whole list. And every time the BBC says anything about something good or positive, they have to add despite Brexit. So I don't think we need to be looking, although I think to be fair, during the actual referendum campaign in the very restricted... They did try to be balanced, um, but since that, <laughs> but since that, with all the work and details that some great people like David Keithley and Lord Pearson have done, it's very clear that they are not in the slightest bit trying to be even-handed. So there is there is this danger, I think, uh, that, that there is this attack back, and of course it's in Parliament uh, that the real attack on the referendum result is being mounted. Now, there was a huge uh, majority for invoking Article 50. In my view, I would have liked to have seen it invoked much, much earlier. I think we wasted a huge, huge amount of time uh, in, in not invoking. And Labour actually was whipped to support Article 50. So no one can say that they didn't vote for something that means that at the end of March 2019, we should be leaving the EU. But those who want to stay in the EU, and particularly those in, in, in my party and some uh, of those people who I don't need to name within the Conservative Party, they really do want another referendum. That's what they really want. And they're using the argument of parliamentary scrutiny to undermine and slow down the passage of the withdrawal bill. Many of them seem, I'm afraid to say, more loyal to the EU mandarins than to the British people. And I find it quite shocking that members of the European Parliament, Labour members of the European Parliament, and indeed uh, I think a couple of Conservative members of the European Parliament, actually voted for a motion to stop and block progress in the negotiations. That was, I think an almost traitorous act of those uh, members of parliament. <laughs> now, the uh, Conservatives, I think, did remove the whip from their MEPs. Uh, Labour, I'm afraid, has, has done nothing, and they're still there, fighting, presumably, to keep their jobs as well as uh, everything else, uh, and basically saying that not enough progress had been made on the three issues that the EU had decided we needed to settle before we went any further. And I think overall, the aim of these people is to replace the, the spirit of optimism and excitement and enthusiasm and enterprising spirit we all felt after the referendum. What they want to do is to replace that with a feeling of helplessness, fatigue, boredom, dejection, and to try to work bit by bit pressuring towards uh, a referendum as the EU has always wanted to happen and has always seen happen. That is what they want to do. And it was really encouraging to hear Barry's uh, remarks at the beginning about the enthusiasm amongst our members here and indeed 
out in the country. You know, sometimes we think that everything is centred around Westminster. Well, it might be at the moment, and I'm certainly glad to be out of it at the moment, what's going on. But uh, the, the um, people out there all over the country, and many of you will have come from different parts of the country today, you know, I don't think they're as obsessed with every dot and comma of what's happening in Parliament or what some of the, what the Evening Standard is saying or some of the media are saying. And our role, of course, and our job is really to make sure that we build that, keep that support and that enthusiasm out there amongst the people who really matter, and they're the people who voted to leave. I do think also that we, ca we should not be trapped into this feeling that somehow this is all about, um, you know, using a term like quantitative terms. It's all about uh, numbers defining trade. It's all about trade. Trade, of course, is important, and many people did vote to leave looking forward to that aim of being able to trade freely with the rest of the world. But, you know, that wasn't really what people voted for. And we have to make sure that we don't get sidelined into trade, 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 and forget what actually people voted for, which was because we know that whatever happens uh, on the trade issue, our critics will always say, even I imagine in 10 years' time when hopefully our global trade is very successful and we are successful, they will still want to point to things to say that it's been a failure. But I think what we need to be showing is that the benefits of independence from the European Union are far wider uh, than trade. We will be controlling our own borders, and that's very, very important. We will... <laughs> and, and, of course, we have to continually do, as we've had to do all along, absolutely differentiate between controlling our own borders and being against all immigration. No one has ever said that in the Leave campaigns. What, of course, the Remain campaigns tried to do was to link that control of borders, no immigration, racism. And it has been quite shocking to find people up and down the country feeling really desperately, more than sad, desperately angry, that because they had a view about wanting their country to be independent and to leave the EU, that they were branded as racists. Now, I think we fought back on that, and we are beginning to get a more sensible attitude, I hope, to that issue. But people voted to control their own borders. They voted to uh, control their own laws. We don't want another court uh, in, in Europe to be telling us what to do and overriding our courts. Now, it's very simple to say that. We want to control our borders. We want to control our money. We want to control our laws. But it's actually, the reality is very, very important because it is deeply important that we remain, to, we continue to say that it is about genuine democracy, not a sort of fake democracy almost about people saying in Parliament now that if Parliament doesn't vote on every single dot and comma of the withdrawal bill that somehow we're not democratic. That is nonsense. It is actually about the public, the British citizens being able to choose in the future governments that will determine our immigration policy our economic policy, our funding priorities, and the direction of legislation that we all live under. Even more importantly, of course, what we can't do at the moment with the European Union, we can vote those governments out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think what they've... <laughs> and I think what we've seen in, in, in the past couple of referendums, elections recently, uh, that... You know, nobody, no politician should ever take the public for granted. I've always felt that the public are actually more sophisticated, more sensible, more careful about how they vote, more tactical about how they vote than we ever, ever give them credit for. So today uh, here we come from obviously different political parties and, and no political parties. And we can have very big disagreements about the future of our country in terms of the economics uh, and uh, what direction we're going on. But I would rather be having that debate uh, and, and the opportunity for governments to implement their ideas and their policies that they've been elected on than having some policies unaccountably created 
and imposed from above. The directives which we have had to put up with over many, many years are part of the reason why people became so disillusioned with the European Union. We had lost control. And so get, gaining, getting back control was not just a, a brilliant little um, uh, a cliche that we could, we could say. It actually meant something because we had lost so much over the years. And outside the European Union, our, our, our politics will count for far more as we will have more scope for action. We won't be able to excuse inaction anymore. The civil servants won't be able to get up and say, oh, well, it was actually because we, we don't have the power. We can't blame Brussels anymore once we leave and become properly and become an independent country. Um, and I think that means that politicians will have to be more accountable. They'll have to be more honest about what they can achieve. Um, and also, I hope it will mean that public will actually want to be more involved because they will see that politics is closer to them than it has been for the last 40 years. And just looking, just looking at um, you know, some of the local government issues, we should be working towards getting real control for local government, but we can't even at the moment. They can't start to build a leisure centre or do something quickly, even if they had the money, without going through the protracted, interminable... Uh, procurement procedures of the European Union. What nonsense. You know, no, no, we should be able to decide how we want to build something and who we want to build it within this country and not having to reach out, uh, unless we want to, to other countries. So I look forward to the opportunities uh, that leaving the EU will give us. Fundamentally, the negotiations are, I believe, uh, very much about the European Union dreading, absolutely dreading the fact that they won't have our money anymore. They want our money. They want our money uh, because they know that when we leave, there is a huge gap, uh, which other smaller countries will, will have to fill in, in, in different ways. And so it's not just a question of them wanting to punish us or to make any other country who's thinking of leaving uh, feel we better not because look what happened to the UK. I think it's also they really do want us to pump up a huge amount of money. And I just want our negotiators, I think as Barry said at the beginning, I want our negotiators to go in there and to be confident about our country, to be absolutely clear that we are not going to be bullied. We're not a country that are bullied. We saw that um, during the history of our country. We're never going to be bullied. And we must be absolutely clear to the negotiators that they're not going to get money unless it is absolutely legally binding that we owe something. We, and the reason that I, along with some others, wrote to the Prime Minister recently saying that if we find the European Union over the next month or two being very, very intransigent, basically saying that they still didn't want to discuss a, 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 a trade arrangement, which would be in their mutual interest as well as ours, that we should simply say, well, sorry, if that's how you feel, then we'll be like every other country outside the European Union. We will simply go over to World Trade, WTO uh, rules, because that would not be a disaster. We know it wouldn't be a disaster, but the, the, the push has been to imply that that would be a disaster, and therefore no one has wanted to talk about it. But the, the, mo the shift is coming, because there is absolutely no doubt about it that within some of the other countries, particularly in Germany, the industry is there, the business is there. They may not be saying it very often publicly, but behind the scenes, we know that they want to get a deal. They want to trade with us, and there is absolutely no reason why that can't happen. But it won't happen if we take a very kind of almost terrified approach of upsetting people in the European Union. So my, my plea to the... Um, my plea to the uh, European... Uh, to our negotiators, and, and I do still have confidence in, in the three key people... Uh, that are negotiating on our behalf. Uh, I'm not so sure I have confidence in some of the other people around the, the cabinet table, but I have confidence in, in those three at the moment that they really want to make sure that we come out uh, quickly, sensibly, uh, and without paying money. But our message must be to them, you must not give in. You must not allow yourselves to be, to be uh, 
brought into that sort of bosom of EU uh, cordiality where they expect in the end someone to agree to something that they want. We will not allow that to happen. We have to keep the faith there. I'm very proud of the work that I did over, over the years, uh, not nearly as much as some of you people in, 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 this, in this hall, but I think that we need to be proud of the fact that we had a positive campaign during the referendum. We're fighting, all of us, in our own ways, in our own different political uh, uh, views, for a country which is more economically just, which is more socially just, which is more democratic, and with that control of our laws, money, borders, and our trade policy. That is what you have kept faith with all these years, and that's what I will continue to do in Parliament when I can. Thank you very much.